Like I remember my first meeting with Jeff Bezos, I was like, why in the world, I, I have been at Intel, why in the world do you want to hire me to work in retail? Like I am not a retail person at all. Hi, today on the show we have Jim Miller, CTO of Wayfair. Wayfair is one of the world's largest e-commerce companies that sells furniture and home goods. Wayfair is not only Wayfair.com, he also owns Domain, All Modern, Paragol, and Burstlane. They're all dedicated to helping shoppers quickly and easily find exactly what they want from selecting from more than 18 million items across, across home furnishings, decor, home improvement, housewares, and more. The company generated $9.1 billion in net revenue for full year 2019, recently turned a profit for the first time since IPO in 2014. Before joining Wayfair, Jim served as the vice president of worldwide operations at Google for almost eight years. He also spent seven years as a senior executive at Cisco, leading supply chain and logistics, Asia operations, new product introduction, advanced technology, and global operations, while the company ramped from $18 billion to over $40 billion in annual revenue. Jim also served as the vice president of supply chain at Amazon and was a key contributor to Amazon's rapid growth into a global company. Jim received his bachelor's degree from Purdue University, an MS from MIT, and an MBA from the Sloan School of Management at MIT. Welcome to the show today, Jim. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you, Jim. Now, let's start with the impact of COVID-19 on Wayfair. And then we see where you think the retail market is going after COVID-19. Yeah. We've yeah. had an amazing quarter with more than 80% jump in sales and actually turned profitable for the first time. Is something you guys expected at the beginning of the pandemic? Well, it's very interesting. Um, you know, I've been the, the CTO now for about a year. But prior to that, I was on the board of directors for uh, over three years. And... So I had a very unique perspective on Wayfair and, and the company's growth in general from being both a board member and now a, a, an officer of the company. Um, we, it's interesting, leaving 2019, we felt like there was a much higher probability of uh, 2020 being a recessionary year. You just looked at the number of consecutive years of growth. So we really pushed, positioned the company proactively um, around a profit model that was predicated on a very conservative growth rate. So we were ideally positioned going into 2020 for what would happen with COVID. Now, obviously, you know, even uh, I remember sitting at the Sundance Film Festival at the end of January, looking at uh, the the tweet or the, the Twitter feed coming out of uh, China around COVID, and uh, there was already a premonition that this was going to be pretty serious, but. Going into, you know, with the lockdown and, and the subsequent uh, economic uncertainty, I can tell you that in early, you know, late February, early March, I don't think anybody really knew how this was going to turn out. Right. And it's one of these scenarios that uh, obviously we've been uh, one of the key benefactors, as is e-commerce and, and the third party carriers as well. Uh, and that's obviously led to the statistics, which you just uh, read off. But it's been an uh, amazingly interesting year. And we are now, like many companies, trying to figure out what is the new normal? Uh, what does retail look like? Uh, you know, I, I, mean, I would tell you, and I don't have a crystal ball, but I don't think that um, a vaccine is imminently around the corner uh, in a way that's going to substantively change the way that we live our life. So I think that the pre-COVID normal is going to be very different than the new normal. And I think e-commerce uh, in general will continue to be buoyed and levered by that considerably. And I think the real question is, what does it mean for brick and uh, mortar re uh, and, uh, and traditional quote unquote retail? Now, the interesting thing about that is that I think many of those companies for reasons that, you know, some of it was due to uh, their position around investment in digital technology. They, they really, for the companies that went into 2020 and into COVID uh, without substantial investment in digital technology and an e-commerce presence, those companies are highly disadvantaged. And yeah. 
I think to the point where I think you're going to see a shuffling of the deck and you've seen that already with the number of bankruptcies that we've seen uh, recently of traditional brick and mortar companies. Many of them will not come back. Okay. So I think it's going to have a profound impact on what the landscape looks like, you know, nine, 12 months from now, which will have a, you know, obviously a uh, ripple effect around things like commercial real estate uh, and ultimately, you know, e-commerce technology, the suppliers, uh, uh, the carriers, et cetera, et cetera. So it's going to, it's going to be interesting to watch. Yeah. My co-host Robin found these two stats that are very interesting to us. One is that uh, we've already gained 5 million new customers in Q2 this year, more than the last four quarters combined. Uh, so within one quarter, you guys re-engaged more than 1 million last customers. We haven't made a purchase in the last 12 months. The That's second right. stat that jumped out at us was that over 70% of the orders per quarter are from repeat customers, or both new and repeat customers continue to grow in volume together. That's just amazing. Those are amazing, amazing stats. Yeah, the customer retention has been quite nice as well. Um, you know, we, ironically, you know, one would think, and it's very, it's almost counterintuitive that with that kind of explosive growth that your, uh, your net promoter scores would go down. Ours, in fact, have actually gone up. Uh, so you look at that dynamic and go, you know, there, there are customers that probably that we know said, I will never buy a piece of furniture off of e-commerce. How do you do that? We, you know, I can't touch it. I can't feel it. Right. Again, we've, we've leveraged technology in a way that, you know, most of the catalog is actually um, presented in 3d digital imagery. So you can do things what with a piece of furniture when it's not just a 2d photograph, you can actually uh, rotate it. You can insert it using an AR or, uh, app into your living room or bedroom or whatever. Yes. I think so. I think what's happened is there's a whole new customer set that never was really intended to go online. They were forced in some cases to go online. They chose yes. us. They had a good experience, and now they're coming back and doing it again. And this really, you know, it's, Hans. It really reminds me of, and, I, and I'm old enough now to remember the whole dot com implosion that happened. Yeah, uh, and. You know, I remember this interesting story where we were sitting around the table. I was at Amazon at the time, and we were all gloom and doom, you know, looking at our portfolios. The whole world had collapsed around uh, uh, the dot-com crash. And yes. I remember Jeff Bezos bounding into the room, as Jeff typically would, with a big smile on his face. And we were all like, you know, why are you, why are you so happy? Why are you smiling? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he said, no, this is great. This will be the best thing for, for Amazon because... It essentially, you know, all these companies that had shaky business models, it will basically take them off the table. Mm -hmm. We'll be able to go buy companies mm -hmm. and, uh, and acquire talent, and it validates our model. Trust me. And, you know, with I, I'm sure you deal with founders a lot uh, in your role. You know, founders have this uncanny ability to, you know, take a lot of muck and see a very clear path through yes. it. And, you know... What's amazing to me is that it, it's not only they see it, they make it happen, right? Yeah. I mean, and that's, I think that's the, the, the beauty and the magic of founders, but he was right. And I think we're seeing another kind of cataclysmic moment where, you know, and, and I don't want to diminish at all the hardships that people are going through. I mean, the economic conditions right yeah. now are not optimal, but it is very much a, a world of haves and have nots. And I think it's going to be, you know, we'll, we're going to look back on this in a few years and realize that it was one of those defining moments that reset the rules of the game and the foundation of, of how we act and uh, conduct ourselves. And it, in some cases, it will accelerate companies like Wayfair. Uh, and in other places, it will unfortunately cause companies to go out of business. But this is one of those mass extinction events that for the strong that survive, it puts them into a whole different category. That is such an interesting comment that you made just there. I even had to write a note down for myself, like this defining moment for not only just consumers, but this entire shift in the industry towards e-commerce and penetration. But Wayfair, you're such a highly recognized brand across North America and even Europe. And you have all these global customers 
but you also have a global supplier base of over 12,000 suppliers right. and you know covering the 18 million products that you have on your on your platform so it's such an incredible international operation so you know with what is happening in covid how disruptive was covid for you and how did you actually manage to fulfill all these fast flowing orders with all the new customers you suddenly had on your platform coming through yeah. this time yeah i mean we we've, we've invested well it's interesting let's step back because i think what most people don't recognize around wayfair or e-commerce in general even in this day and age people don't understand the technical and the platform sophistication of clicking on something and having it show up at their doorstep a few days later. And that could be a couch for, you know, I mean, and I find that even more impressive having been involved in e-commerce most of my life, getting a book or, a, you know, a, a phone case to you in a few days is, or a day or so is, is relatively easy now, but getting a couch to you in a couple of days is much more difficult to do. So, what we've done and we've been doing, you know, the company is 17 years old. Uh, so it's not like a, a newcomer to the e-commerce scene, but we've really built a tech platform. So we built a very high degree of integration with our supply base, but we've also built a back-end supply chain as well. So for example, um, we are a large consolidator for Asia shipments. Uh, now, we have a supply base that also is domestic and, and obviously centered around the, uh, the furniture capital of the U.S., which is North Carolina. But there's a number of things that we do and work with our suppliers to actually integrate into their supply chains very tightly coupled in a tightly coupled way. So that we were able to, you know, uh, continue to work with them around joint planning and joint um, coordination of their supply chains. Now, that being said... The whole world was disrupted by COVID-19. Uh, if you look at our supply base all over the globe right now, there's still, you know, China, for example, is, is you know, quickly coming back into normal production. But most of our suppliers went through, uh, you know, a week-long to month-long period where they were doing no production. So you saw this, you know, scarcity in the supply chain, which fortunately is just now starting to get back to normal which is, is great considering we're right on around the corner from the holiday season where we tend to do a lot of our business as well. Um, and again, um, you know, uh, it was a, it was a mixture of, of luck and, and solid execution. But again, I mean, I think the, the thing is, and I've been doing outsourcing and, and working in these distributed environments my entire life now, the, the, the tighter the coupling that you have with your supply base, so you don't have a at arm's length distance, but you're actually working jointly with them and collaboratively with them is the difference between success and failure. And I don't think this is, I don't think we did anything so fundamentally and substantially different than we were doing before COVID. It just, that type of integration facilitated, um, you know, the, the, the ease of coming out of the COVID situation and recovering and getting back to normal. But we're seeing now, most of the supply chains getting back to a uh, fairly normal type of production rate. Um, and again, you know, the, the biggest disruption right now is uh, because air travel and travel in, in, in general is, is now greatly curtailed, just getting back to normal um, uh, movement of things like air freight and things like that. And fortunately not, most of our products don't move by air freight, they move by sea. Right, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I was just going to say, you, you mentioned shipping, you know, a phone case to you is very different than shipping a Wayfair item. Uh, on the smaller side, your average shipment is 30 pounds. And on the That's large right. side, it's 80 pounds. And so the fact that you can control the last mile logistics most of the time is also, you know, a huge plus for you. Yeah. Yeah, we, we built uh, this system called Castlegate. And Castlegate, the way to think about it is we bring in inventory from our suppliers and that allows us to aggregate shipments in a way that then we can optimize the last mile. And that being said, we made substantial investments in both Castlegate and something we call the Wayfair Delivery Network. In fact, I'm getting a Wayfair delivery today and it will show up to my house uh, this afternoon. It's two chairs and it will be delivered by a delivery van with employees with Wayfair shirts. Uh, so it's part of our third-party network or the network that we're building 
to actually facilitate last mile. Because again, you know, we work closely with large carriers, but delivering products like a couch or chairs is different than most of the shipments that we typically encounter. So, you know, I go back to the early days of Amazon. We were forced to go and we chose to go build vertically integrated capabilities because we felt like we could do it better and from a quality perspective or from an economics, you know, we can do it better than USPS or, or they could, sorry. And, you know, we're going to continue to build and integrate where we think that we can uh, provide an outside advantage to our customers and do it in a way that's, you know, economically prudent and justified. But I can, but I contend we'll continue to invest very heavily in our outbound and last mile uh, capabilities. And I think that'll position us well for, future capabilities and categories and services that, that we may choose to provide. But we're, yeah, very much build, but we're very much building a platform. Yeah, I'm coming back to this, this, this network that you're building in a second. You mentioned uh, t- technology and uh, that having that as a competitive advantage a few times now. Uh, with 5G coming and bandwidth be almost 100x what we have in 4G, what are the, the new things that you could imagine happening? Maybe not necessarily to wait for it, because why don't we make a, sure. sort of forecasting um, sort of comments, but in general, what what yeah. what, what, what type of does, does, does that show for you? Yeah, look, I mean, I spent my entire career around information technology, uh, starting, you know, in a very mainframe-like world of IBM and then moving from, you know, the PC to cloud computing and everything in between. Yeah. It's amazing to me, and I, I find it... Um, interesting because the world's kind of flip-flop between centralized computing and, you know, now yeah. cloud computing. It, it, yeah. It's interesting. It goes from distributed to central and yeah. back. Yeah. I, I think with 5G, coupled with edge computing capabilities, it's going to be amazing because right now, for example, let's when you, we talk about natural language synthesis, uh, ML and AI, whether it's inference or training, <clears throat> pardon me, we're forced to do that in the cloud right now because that's where the intensive computing capability is. And the reality is that our you know, devices or edge devices don't have that type of, of capability yet. In a 5G world with enhanced edge computing, I think a lot of what we're doing today is gonna migrate to the edge and be just in further distributed. So I think for example, again, Google Translate or Siri for that matter, you're still doing the inference in the cloud and you're still bound to having network. Um, You know, I go back to the little star war days of doing, you know, the tricorder where it could translate, you know, uh, bi-directionally any language. Well, you can do that with 5g and having a, uh, a part of that inference chip now residing in the phone. And that's all the, that's certainly being implemented in design right now into the next generation of Apple and Android phones. Yep. So I think the ability to bring that edge computing, you know, and the, the, the large pipe now, uh, along with that, you know, just enables a whole set of capabilities around AR, VR, natural language synthesis, ML and AI, um, you know, and, and all the things that it brings in a way that, that all that, that, that happens today uh, in a central cloud environment, it's going to happen with your phone. And you, know, you look at the phone and it's, you know, I don't know what, 15 years ago, the phone was a phone and it was basically, you know, uh, that's all that it was used for. You look at it today and the phone, you know, think about the, the myriad of things that you do with your phone today. Well, that's about to explode again. And I think it's exciting. You know, you're, you're in the world of venture capital. I think that that's going to open up all kinds of interesting business models opportunities for new companies, new capabilities. It, it, and it's going to, it will, again, revolutionize and provide another wave of growth. Uh, but I think it's a tr- tremendous, and it's going to impact every vertical, medical, supply chain logistics. Right. It's, it, it's going to be exciting. And I really, and I, I think I bought into the hype cycle. I mean, you can, you after you've been through this a number of times, you can just right. see. Kind of the the yeah. That's right. Yep. That's yep. right. Um, your CEO, Naraj, recently, well, not recently, on, on the earnings call last year, um, he mentioned that way first strategic priorities are international expansion and building your own logistics system. Uh, this is especially relevant for you since you started your e-commerce career with Amazon. 
why did he pick those two things as the, the strategic initiative? And what are some of the challenges and opportunities that you see uh, as these get implemented? Yeah, let's treat each one of those um, separately. Um, well, first of all, I think he chose those because when you look at the TAM that we have available to us, it's an $800 billion TAM worldwide. Uh, so again, and we we always talk about, you know, as any company does, uh, all companies ultimately are limited uh, from where they can put in capital and where they can make investments. Um, so I, I believe that the two that we chose were maybe a little orthogonal in terms of, of the what they do for the company. So when you think about international expansion, it opens up new customers, new markets for us, and it expands our top line mm -hmm. uh, opportunity. When you think about the logistics network that we're building, it really provides top line or bottom line efficiency, uh, vertical integration, where we think that, that we can provide outsized value. And secondly, it improves dramatically the customer experience. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, any e-commerce company and you ask them, you know, where can you improve the customer experience? It usually falls into two areas. One is speed uh, and visibility into delivery, and then also uh, returns and reverse logistics. So again, um, you know, I mean, I would tell you that I, to this day, I, I don't think uh, many companies know how to do large parcel delivery well and make it a good customer experience. You know, and, and again, when you look at the landscape of the third party providers out there, we want to partner with them. But at the same time, we know we've got to go build that our own capability in that space as well, because nothing really exists out there where you would look at it and go, that's a benchmark experience. Right. Uh, and this is, you know, this is one of those areas where uh, it's, it's well underserved. Uh, but, you know, again, and then. Back to international expansion, the way we think about that is, and, and this shouldn't come as a big surprise, uh, and we haven't we haven't stated anything publicly about where we'll expand, and, and I, I certainly won't today either. But you look at, for example, okay, great. Um, let's just take uh, Spanish-speaking people. You know, the first thing that you would do is go and, in my opinion, you'd serve the Spanish-speaking uh, speaking population of the U.S. Now that you've got that capability. Now you can serve Latin America, you can serve certainly Mexico, you can serve Spain. And, and again, when you think about international expansion, you can think about it from a language um, perspective. You have to think about it from a locality perspective, because as it turns out, furniture and fashion is something highly localized. Uh, you, know, you look at Germany fashion versus in, in, in terms of their uh, their tastes and interests versus the UK versus the US. They're dramatically different. So you can take the, the platform of a catalog, but the actual items in that catalog have to be suited uniquely for a particular geography and market and local uh, local uh, tastes. So again, there's this natural progression, but you know, we think that, that both looking at international expansion and looking at improving the customer experience continues to serve us, will serve us very well and will be highly leveraged, uh, you know, with the, the plans that we've got for future growth. Yeah. Just shifting gears a little bit. And I know you probably get this question all the time. And given that you, you did spend a number of years at Amazon, but for the benefit of the audience, how do you compete with Amazon? Well, it's interesting. I think that um, you certainly can't ignore Amazon because they are the 800 pound gorilla. I will tell you that you can't get maniacally fixated on them either. Uh, I think that, you know, you go back to Jeff Bezos. I think what Jeff did and, you know, really his secret sauces was this maniacal focus on the customer experience. Um, so I think that, uh, again, um, I, you know, I, I don't think that we should be maniacally focused on what Amazon's doing and try to copy them. But I think what we should be doing is staying maniacally focused on what the customer wants. Sure. And, you know, we talk about the customer being a she because the vast majority of our customers are female. We know our customer extremely well. There's a high degree of brand loyalty. There's a high degree of, of affinity. When you talk to a customer, whether that's an interior designer or uh, an end consumer of Wayfair, there is this emotive response, right? I mean, 
I was liking it to, you know, I, I, I use my windows PC, but I love my Mac. Uh, one's a utility <laughs> and the other one is, you know, I have the semi love affair with it because the, of the, you know, the user interface, the, you know, the look and feel, whatever. Right. And when I talk to Wayfair customers, and it's funny because I have a down jacket that I wear and Wayfair, you know, over the years has gained a lot of, uh, a lot of brand, uh, notoriety and, uh, brand recognition. And, you know, I was in Carmel a couple of weeks ago and walking around downtown Carmel and I had a Wayfair, uh, jacket on and there were people coming up to me saying, oh, do you work at Wayfair? And I'm like, <laughs> uh, yeah. And they were like, oh my God, let me tell you how much I love your company. And right. to me, that is, you know, an endorsement. It's, it's, it's really weird because, you know, I was accustomed to that at Google, but not, you know, I mean, three years ago, I, you know, people probably wouldn't have given a second look, but now, right. you know, it, it, it's kind of an odd experience, but, um, you know, when you know that you're evoking that kind of response from people, you know, that you've done something magical with your brand, but the brand is really the tip of the spear, uh, because, you know, if you're not providing selection, you're not providing quality delivery experience, people aren't deriving value from the brand. I mean, the brand name is a brand name, right? You can go build a brand name, but if you don't have the goods behind it, uh, you know, you're not going to continue to build that brand. So, so it was like this kind of crazy endorsement. I walked away saying, oh, wow, there's something, something happening here, which is, uh, which is super interesting. So I think you'd be happy to know that I am a proud Wayfair customer and outfit in many rooms in my house with Wayfair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I actually save your uh, mail, mail order clippings <laughs> uh, quite, a, quite often because I always come across a friend, even one of our colleagues, uh, Madhu, who recently moved, you know, in the Bay Area. Yeah, he yeah. was like, you know, I'm moving to a new apartment. What should I do? And where yeah. should I get my furniture? And I'm like, oh, well, I have a 10% Wayfair coupon. You can use. <laughs> you so, know, here you go. And it's, it's interesting because, um, you know, one of the things that I think about is technology and we've seen so many industries and uh, business models disrupted by technology. You know, I think the cool thing about Wayfair and one of the things that attracted me to the board many years ago was the fact that, you know, my wife's an interior designer and she works with interior designers as well. Um, everybody aspires like I, I'm, I, I joke because I have no taste when it comes to furniture and style. It's just not something I can't look at a color palette. It's not in my DNA. I'm an engineer and, and uh, you know, um, so I can't really look at something and go, you know, Hey, that will, um, that will go together. It will create a motif. It will create a, an atmosphere or look and feel. And that's something that, that she does extremely well, but the vast majority of people, they want that. But because of where they're located or can, uh, candidly their financial means, they don't have access right. to that. And I think, again, when you think about cool applications of ML and AI, I mean, I talked to yep. her and it's like, okay, so, you know, you're, you're, you're doing this thing, this room. Tell me, like, walk me through the logic tree of like, how do you choose the color palette, the furniture, the layout? And what she talks about is candidly an ML model. I mean, right. you can just, it, 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 you know, and it's like, wow, if she can do that, we can teach a model how to do that. And, yes. you know, is it going to replace every, you know, interior designer? Absolutely not. But I think it democratizes the ability to say, hey, I've got this room, take a picture of it. We can meta tag the motif, and then we can provide the customer, the potential customer with a, a you know, uh, a curated selection that is not going to clash or be wildly out of sync with that particular motif of the room. Or you, you know, the, when you think about it, there's so many cool things that you can do with technology, but again, it's all predicated on building a technical platform, which I, and that's the cool thing being the CTO that I see and, and the opportunity that we've got. This is actually, a, you know, a question that, that is for Hans now. And given that, you know, you're such a big investor in e-commerce and technology, how do you see the future of vertical e-commerce player? Um, yeah, sorry. How do you see the future of vertical e-commerce players as they face, you know, ever more powerful Amazon? Well, Robert, you know, you know this well. Um, when, when I joined GDB in 2013, 
and make investing in vertical e-commerce as a, one of the central theme of my, my investment thesis over the next seven years. And, um, uh, and it's so good to have you join us so we can do that uh, together. Um, looking at Wish, Poshmark, um, StockX, Peloton, um, every single one of them is a vertical player. And I look at the ones that are successful, um, they, 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 they're doing or have done what Jim's saying, which is delighting the, the customer and make a certain segment of a population or their target users uh, love them uh, a lot for whatever reasons. Um, for Wish, it was the um, more of mass market, bottom half of the pyramid, um, delight them with such amazing prices in selection. Um, for Peloton, is this amazing experience that once you're on, you don't want to get off and um, you tension raise over 95%. Um, for Poshmark is that community of Posh, um, um, Posh Fest that have helped to foster in, uh, on, the, on the app, just uh, people congregating, talking about style and fashion, not just about selling clothes. Um, and uh, uh, StockX, just the, a lot of sneaker hats on it. So that communal feel, that kind of uh, being delighted with uh, just, uh, surprises and um, amazing customer experience. If you can nail that, that's how you're going to be different from, 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 from Amazon because Amazon is amazing. But I mean, even the, the example James just walked through, I, uh, I, I'm remodeling my third house now in the last seven years. And you see the pattern uh, over time. Like it's, it, This process can be so much faster if this machine learning and recommendation that makes it a lot easier to go from designer to actually have the product in your house. Um, so it, 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 this is so much more can be done. I, I'm totally excited what 5G can bring. This is why I asked Jim the question. And it's also why, why I became a shareholder in Wayfair during COVID-19. So there's so much more to do and I, I can't wait. Yeah, I share that same belief. I mean, it's interesting. I, I, I'm with you. The whole direct to consumer, the whole vertical, it's all about the customer experience and creating that stickiness and engagement. I, I would love Amazon. I mean, I'm a big Amazon customer, but to me, it's almost that I'm not sure that I'll get this right, but it's almost like a, a guerrilla shopping experience, right? I mean, I go to Target, I've got my list, I know what I need, I get in, I get out, and, you know, hopefully, I, you know, it, it's been a, you know, a frictionless experience, but I don't, I'm not one to like sit around and, and like, you know, the engagement is not there. And I think that, you know, again, when you think about all these uh, uh, companies that, that uh, Hans mentioned, the, the defining characteristics of those are stickiness, engagement, and predicated on a great experience. And I'm a customer of many of those as well. And again, it's that whole emotive feeling around, you know, for, you know, for a variety of reasons, selection, engagement. Uh, but again, I think that there's, there, it's a big market and there, there'll be plenty of places for people to establish their, their, their niche, their large and profitable niche and continue to do well. Yeah. And well, hunger is one of those categories that actually, uh, as you mentioned, benefited significantly during this t t uh, pandemic. Uh, a lot of people's travel budget um, got changed and went into um, shopping for the, the backyard and home. Um, how, how does COVID 19 change what you think about the offline stores? You mentioned a lot of them are closed and they may not come back. Yeah. Is there any chance that they could figure out a, a new best model uh, to compete um, later? or? Or is this completely lost? Well, as you know, you know, you look at, we have 17 years of experience of becoming an e-commerce company and doing it well is very difficult. Um, and doing it well at scale is very difficult. Again, partly because of the Amazons of the world, they've educated us on, and they've set the benchmark for what a customer experience is. Like, you know, I'm sure we all appreciate the sophistication and complexity of getting something to you in two days, but you know, that very, very, very few people can do that. And most of these, you know, when you look at, I mean, I've got a team of over 3000 uh, software engineers and product managers, that is a huge investment in technology. Uh, and we're able to hire, you know, a very, very capable, very high quality uh, level of, of talent. Um, most of these companies aren't considered destinations for tech people. Uh, so I think they're, they're going to continue to struggle. And if, you know, again, now 
I think the opportunity that this creates is for the Shopify's of the world and the third party providers. Because if, if I were an executive coming from a traditional retail company and I did not have the capability, I would bootstrap it with a third party, understanding that I think eventually, because this is so integral to the omni-channel experience and value that the company creates, you've got to create that capability in-house. But I think it's a matter of survival right now. And doing it organically and in-house, there's no way that you can do it in the in the timeline that you, that's required right now. So I would really look at it and bootstrap and figure out who can I partner with to go make that capability. And then, you know, obviously over time transition to an in-house capability, but that's going to probably take five to 10 years to actually get right for some of these big brands that, that, that weren't, you know, actively engaged and, and down that path already. Yeah. My uh, partner at Glenn likes to say that every company needs to be a technology company now. And if you don't do that, it, it's very difficult to survive. And this very example is, uh, and, and my partner Jeff as well is uh, Domino Pizza. Um, you know, taste of Domino Pizza hasn't changed in the last 10 years, but yep. the delivery mechanism to make that work and the efficiency, the ruthless efficiency it generates is um, uh, amazing. Um, yep. And you, you don't have that kind of DNA or can acquire that DNA in the next 10 years, especially with 5G coming, it's going to be terrible for you. Yeah. Yeah. I think about, I've got a large data science team and this is one of the, uh, you know, when I, when I was interviewing for the board now almost six years ago, I, you know, what I saw was in Stephen Nurge was this, you know, understanding and infusing data science and analytics and data through everything that we do. And for me, that was one of those, wow, this is very different because most people don't do that from day one. They really, you know, what, but they figured it out, but I'm with you, you know, the customer intimacy and, the capability to really understand attributes of your customer. And, you know, from that's an outbound facing or an outward facing uh, perspective, but, but inwardly using data to drive efficiency and eliminate friction. I mean, you have to have that as part of your DNA. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned just the fact that you have to have this capability, the technology capabilities for both fulfillment uh, as well as omni-channel. And so, you know, this year has been such a defining year for retail. I mean, we, we've seen retail struggle for the past few years, but now, you know, Amazon is taking on shopping malls, turning them into warehouses. And, you know, you, you mentioned Shopify, you know, they're, they're doing some of the same things. And so what are some big trends that you see overall in retail? Yeah, look, I mean, I mean, I think there's an opportunity for retail that I find fascinating, and I don't understand why they haven't embraced it more fully. The thing that, you know, I don't know if you saw yesterday in the Wall Street Journal that Amazon announced that they're building a thousand warehouses in neighborhoods. The yep. challenge that Amazon's got is they've got a last mile problem too, because yes. the economic density to deliver same day, well, it's all predicated on density. Yes. So it's ironic because their advantage in the early days was let's go build a limited number of warehouses or fulfillment centers that could serve a, a vast number of people. That served right. them very well for kind of two day -ish shipping, but that has limitations to it, right? Yes. So now you've got to start and localize. So let's, let's set that aside right now. When you look at like a Walgreens or a Rite Aid, you know, and, and again, this is, it's a philosophy where a lot of these retail companies that I've worked with in the past, they've treated their e-commerce uh, system as something very unique. And I think the advantage of a lot of companies, whether you're in the grocery business or, you know, CPG or whatever is, you've got this local presence. I mean, take Walgreens. Walgreens guy has thousands of stores across the U.S., They've got the last mile figured out. How do you couple? And there, and I would argue every one of those stores with some slight modifications is an inventory stocking point. The right. way you compete with an Amazon is you use that local presence. And, you know, you actually do buy online, pick up in store, or you, you know, partner with, with carriers to do same day or, or same hour delivery. Yeah. And, but again, that's a technical problem. And it's a logistics problem that you've got to go work through. 
And they don't, they don't, they haven't embraced that in mass. You know, they're just starting to with, you know, grocery doing buy online pickup uh, in store or curbside pickup. But you just look at that and go, that's something they should have been embracing 10 years ago. Exactly. And I, I still believe that that is a huge opportunity for somebody to go in and build the last mile that says, okay, great. I'm going to go buy something and it might be a target. It might be a, I don't know, uh, a Walgreens or a CVS and something else. And somebody else does third party aggregation of all that and brings it to my house uh, within this, you know, within the same day. To me, that's a, that's a, that is a, you know, a, uh, a value creator for me that starts to compete with Amazon. Uh, but I think, again, you've got to have that vision and that, that capability to, re- to see something completely different. But again, I don't think Amazon's going to take over retail in the U.S., but I think the retail, the traditional retailers have to get far more smarter and strategic uh, about, you know, not incrementalizing this thing, but really reimagining what that model looks like in a world where, you know, uh, and COVID's a great catalyst for all that, in my opinion. Yeah, we talk about this a lot. Hans, what what are some some big trends that you see as well? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead, Hans. No, I was going to say that um, I, I, Rita and I interviewed um, the CEO of um, uh, Miss Fresh uh, from China um, several months ago, and their model was uh, uh, doing, uh, and for the last five years now, doing exactly what Amazon just started doing uh, this year. Which is uh, set up um, mini storefronts um, in uh, neighborhoods, but they're not storefronts really. They're they're all mini warehouses. Yeah. And, and then and then it goes back to Jim's point: it's all about density. If you have enough number of orders and uh, they're close enough to each other, then a delivery person can deliver five orders uh, an hour. Then unit economics will be positive. So yeah. if you can nail that in a highly dense um, populated area. And, and start building that capability out. And over time, the uh, the, uh, the know-how, the skill in unit economics will make it a, a very interesting business. And that's what Amazon is doing in, in the U.S. now uh, as well, because you need, you need to have enough density to justify uh, the number of orders in that particular neighborhood to justify having that mini warehouse there, or else it's just uh, burn too much too much cash. So it's not that they don't know this model can work. They have to wait until there's enough orders in that neighborhood before they can start doing that. And once that happens, oh my God, this is going to be an inflection point, tipping point. Yep. And it's going to be terrible for uh, local retailers offline to compete. And um, it, it, it doesn't take a rocket science to figure it out. You can do curbside pickup and that kind of thing with the offline stores. And each store um, should be a, uh, a stocking, uh, stop putting inventory for people to order online. But organizationally and culturally, it's just so difficult for offline yep. guys with each store management to think like that. It's yep. not one of the type that people that walk into the store. It's also the other people who are not coming in, they're ordering online. That's part of your customers too. You have to take care of them. Or else in the long run, when everybody's busy, there's not enough time, they're, they're, and, and you, know, you want to do things at your own time, um, getting stuff delivered in a matter of three hours, two hours, which is what JD and, 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 and Alibaba are doing that in China. When that happens in the US, there's not going to be a lot of hope for, for offline retailers in the US. But I'll tell you, just like and, you know, I think it's fascinating what Hans said, because you look at innovators dilemma, right? And this is a perfect example of where even Amazon is subject to innovators dilemma, right? Because yeah. you look at the hyperlocalization driven by population density of both India and China. And to yeah. be candid, if I were looking at probably some of the most innovative things happening in logistics and fulfillment today, I wouldn't go to the U.S. I would go to India and I would go to China because right. these hyper local markets are driving this interesting petri dish of experimentation yes. that you don't see in the U.S. So I would so I would argue that Amazon, I'm sure they would they would if they could defend themselves they they would say they're a hyper global company. But I think even right. they're subjected to the innovators' dilemma in some of this stuff. Yeah, and just the population density difference in these countries determine what kind of path. You can exactly. take because you don't have enough property density. You do all this, you're going to burn too much money. It's not going to be a viable business model. That's um, right. So it is. It just. It just going to be fascinating. And with five G coming, the the way that product can be shown on a smartphone, it will be very different. It could be a lot more AR and VR component that we yeah. have not seen uh, before. And 
when you have a visual experience of what's like being a store and inside the store in the comfort of your home, and you can just with one click get something in two hours. This is like imagine what Peloton has done with all that content, uh, and so turn your home into a gym yeah. and take that, expand that into all the retail. And over time, with Alexa, you can just order. Uh, it'll you have an order. Your sis will tell you, "Hey, given your pattern, this is the things that you're missing. We're gonna run out of this in a, in a, in a, in a couple of days, or we're gonna run out of it today. Do you want to order?" And you say yes, and it's done. The, 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 how how is the offline retail going to compete with our experience? Is going to be right. faster in the next year. Well. And, and, you know, back to the point of, of what are some of the emerging trends, I, I still, I think some of the fascinating problems yet to be solved in e-commerce, for example, is how do you bring these massive catalogs to people in the most organized and intuitive way? I don't think anybody solved that problem well yet. Um, you know, how do you bring that store, that, that look and feel of a brick and mortar store to people in their living room? We haven't figured that out yet either. So again, and I'm not, you know, condemning anybody out there. It's it's a cool problem that that just needs to be solved. And I think this is again where technology is going to play a, a phenomenally interesting role. But we haven't figured that quite out yet. And I think, you know, again, this is those are the kind of problems that I wake up and go, okay, okay, that's an amazing problem. How do we go solve that? Yeah, you know, it's Rami. You're a shrewd shopper yourself. What do you what do you think? What are the trends you pay attention to? I mean, I, I get the uh, the convenience part of like, oh, it would be so amazing to just have this in my house in two hours. But I also, you know, I am an avid shopper and I do really like the experience of discovery, right? And like treasure hunting. And, and I really, if you, if you tell me like, oh, I go to Target all the time and actually love spending time going through the $1 section of Target with my husband, <laughs> For me to do. We also like to do that on AliExpress and Wish as well. I know, but like that amount of time there in person versus that amount of time on Amazon or on Wish or AliExpress is, is not comparable. Not the same. Right? Not the same yeah. And yep. it's just not, not as fun and probably not buy as much <laughs> yeah. uh, online. So I'm curious to, to see, like, can you really take away that joy um, with with the habits that have been formed, you know, for decades for people? And um, maybe, maybe, it, maybe it will be like that for my son, who's 10 months old and, you know, never, never cares about going to the mall because uh, he can't even go to the mall during COVID anyway. So, <laughs> yeah, so I'm curious to see, like, how the population will, will take this because everybody has such a has such a different experience with technology and the adoption of technology so um even well, jim you, you talked about that right like you, you you don't really love decorating and so um but your wife does yep yeah, but i yep. appreciate i appreciate a nice house <laughs> this is not my forte <laughs> I can probably say this. Um, yeah, I'm a few years younger than Jim, but both of us grew up when we go to a mall and play arcade, um, play those games. And people, high school kids, middle school kids, love to get together and play play games in in the mall. And if I look at my my uh, daughter and son, there's no way that even that thought would never cross their mind at all. Constantly just um, on uh, Switch or on uh, iPads playing uh, Roblox or um, Animal Farm and so forth with their friends. It is uh, it is such a different experience, and it's literally within the last thirty years. Um, and so, with five G, it, it will be even more dramatic. So, Absolutely, okay. yeah. I mean, I've got a twenty year old and yeah, you know, twenty year old son, and I mean, you know, he was he's outfitting his apartment in LA right now, and he's like, "I'm doing all online," you know. And we were talking, he goes. <laughs> I don't go to the store. Like my generation just doesn't really want to go to the mall. We don't want to go to the store. Like, and I was like, and do you have any trepidation about buying furniture online? He's like, N -n -n. he looked at me like I was crazy. He's like, what are you talking about? He goes, it's just another category. It's like, okay. <laughs> so it's just, I mean, obviously it's all generational, right? And your 10, your 10 month old is going to grow up in a vastly different world. I mean, no, than than the one that we live in today. Yeah, he was born with Alexa, so yeah. <laughs> totally yeah. different. He's not yep. feel creepy. <laughs> so um, I, I want to bring it back a little bit about you know Jim and your career. And yeah. you you spent such a significant amount of time both on West Coast and now 
uh, in Boston as mm-hmm. well. And so how, how would you compare these two coasts and, and the talent scenes and the tech scenes? Well, I mean, Silicon Valley is a unique place on the planet, right? And I think that, um, you know, I would say Boston is probably where Seattle was, you know, probably my colleagues are going to probably hit, hit me upside the head for saying this, but, but it's still, it's still up and coming. I think, uh, you know, there, you're, it's a benefactor of the globalization of the Amazons of the world and, and the, the Microsofts of the world go to Cambridge or Kendall square. And, you know, within a, a baseball throw of Kendall square, the T stop, you can hit all of the big tech companies along with biotech. Um, so I think that that the talent is there. Um, it just doesn't have the critical mass that um, that you see in, in the Bay Area. But that being said, I still contend the Bay Area is a unique place on the planet, both you know, from this unique amalgam of money, intellect, you know, that West Coast kind of can-do attitude. Mm-hmm. Uh, and liberalism, which I think does have a, uh, a profound impact mm-hmm. on, you know, uh, on companies and, and the way that people think and that entrepreneurialism. Uh, but there are very, there, I mean, I see many, many elements of it in Boston as well. And, and I don't, I would tell you that I don't think Boston in any way has hindered our ability to go build a great company um, within, you know, and I mean, I think the big question is what's the COVID effect? Like, you know, does it matter anymore? I mean, will it matter that we're in Boston and that, you know, some of our talent may be out here on the West Coast? I think that's actually COVID could be a huge, you know, depending upon our strategy around remote work, labor, uh, force and labor uh, strategies. Who knows? Right. Uh, but I think it, it means less and less. And I think that'll not be another, you know, not unintended consequence, but we don't know how it's going to play out yet. And, you know, a number of companies, we, we haven't gotten there yet, but a number of companies like Twitter have said, we're never going back to the office. You can debate whether that's right or wrong, but, um, and what that will do from an innovation standpoint, I think Reed Hoffman has been very, very adamant that he wants to go back to Netflix as soon as possible because he thinks that there's an innovation gap. I tend to tend to agree with him, by the way, that, uh, right. uh, that there is this, you know, getting people together physically and, Having that, you know, interactive back and forth is you can't do it. You can't replicate it yet on Zoom or or Jamboard or Miro or any of the other forums out there. Yeah. Speaking of Seattle, and you're probably a great person to ask this question to, is that um, my board was told the first 20 executives at Seattle, uh, at, at Amazon, uh, most, if not all, are not from Seattle. Um, and um, somehow uh, Seattle will become the place to plan routes for Jeff Bezos and ends up hiring a lot of people from outside to go there. And then yeah. that completely changed how Seattle is. I mean, there's Microsoft's always there, but Amazon's e-commerce and was, was yeah. consumer facing was a complete different feel. Um, and that changed Seattle forever. How, how true is that um, statement? I think it's very true. I think if you look at Jeff, uh, you know, when Jeff was at D.E. Shaw in New York and he at 93 or 94, he decided to create Amazon. He, you know, typical Jeff, he did a very explicit kind of, you know, uh, whiteboard exercise around, you know, where was it desirable to live? Where could we get talent? You know, the Bay Area, one of the challenges, it's already saturated. And, you know, he he didn't want to be in that fight for talent. Uh, so I, and I think, I think the everything store book chronicles that decision-making pretty well. Uh, but he, he was very, uh, explicit and purposeful in moving to Seattle. And then, you know, when I was there, in fact, I was talking to somebody about this last night. I, I think that half of the exec team was former Princeton people that he had known or had a connection from. And there still is a large Princeton contingent on the exec team even today. Mm-hmm. It, it's fascinating how many people have stayed there in different roles, mm-hmm. perhaps, but, but they've mm-hmm. stayed loyal to Jeff. Uh, but I think, yeah, to, the, to your point, a number of people like Jeff Holden, Jeff Wilkie, uh, Rick Dalzell, uh, our first CTO, came from Walmart and Bentonville. Again, you saw this. He had this uncanny ability to attract great talent. And... 
you know, I mean, Seattle was an undiscovered kind of gem at the time. Right. Totally. And, I mean, I mean, I lived there for seven years and it's still one of my favorite places to on the planet. Yep. Um, it's beautiful. You know, yeah. And it, it, you know, I mean, we can sit here and, and argue. I don't think it, it's the Bay Area has changed a lot over the last 20 plus years. Uh, I think Seattle still maintained a little bit of that. I mean, I think the Microsoft and the Seattle shadow loom large, which has created, you know, again, I, I don't want to make social discourse, but it's it's created great opportunities, but it's also had its challenges as well. Yes. But I don't think it has, has had such a profound impact as maybe the Bay Area. Uh, so again, it's still a great, it's still a great place to live and work. Yeah. As in the spirit of comparing things, um, you, you're a veteran building global companies with almost 20 years experience in companies like Google, Cisco, Amazon, and now Wayfair. What are some of the sort of career defining moments that you can share as you make a transition one to the other? What were sort of the thinking <laughs> and the Jeff Bezos, like a systematic way of thinking that gets you decide that this is the right trend or this is right uh, company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I'm probably the worst person in the world to talk about career planning because I don't think I've ever done it. Um, you know, I left MIT in 93 and, and uh, you know, I think the common thread of all of my career choices have been to go to an area that's growing uh, and not necessarily in this order, but to work on really interesting problems in growth areas with incredible people that you're going to learn a lot from and that you find inspirational. Like I remember my first meeting with Jeff Bezos. I was like, why in the world? I, I have been at Intel. Why in the world do you want to hire me to work in retail? Like I am not a retail person at all. <laughs> and I remember spending like 30 minutes trying to convince Jeff or, or maybe not convince Jeff, but it's like really trying to understand like, why in the world do you want to hire me? And then I realized, you know, in retrospect, that, that Jeff really liked the fact that I came from a continuous flow operation. I mean, I had run a plant building Pentium chips. Right. And when you think about the discipline and the process philosophy around building a microprocessor and doing it, you know, building hundreds of thousands, if not millions of these things with minimal defect rate, right. a lot of those attributes are the same attributes that you want to put into a high volume e-commerce fulfillment yeah. system. And that was Jeff's now, you know, I say that in retrospect because I really had to think about that, but, but, Jeff, <laughs> but, but here's the magic of Jeff Bezos. Jeff, Jeff right. saw that already. Right. I mean, he was like, right. Hey, this is, this is what I want to go build. Right. Yep. And, uh, you know, he hired Wilkie, uh, out of Allied Signal who was running a, uh, a carpet fiber, uh, and a specialty chemicals plant for some of right. those same reasons. Right. So, I mean, again, um, I mean, I think if you, if you, I've never had a job. I, mean, I always wake up in the morning and go, I, I really can't wait to go to work because there's fascinating people and problems to go and solve and learn from. And I think if you, you know, and I've been attracted to people that I think they view that as kind of a mission, not necessarily a job. And, you know, it's funny. I was having a conversation with somebody the other day and that I grew, that I grew up with and they, they were like, what? Why? I mean, you were kind of retired after Google. Why in the world would you want to go get another job? Like their, their whole modus operandi or, or their decision calculus was like, you should be sitting on the beach in Santa Cruz, like with a, you know, a in your hand. And I, and I said, what's your worldview of, of what a success? And, you know, to them, it was like a destination or some, you know, figure in the bank. And I said, right. to be perfectly blunt, that's not ever what's no. motivated me. I, you know, that, that is kind of a dividend, but that's mm -hmm. not the goal. The mm -hmm. goal is how do you go and create change and do things that are going to, that's ultimately going to change the world and impact. impact. And if you, so if you, if you use that as your North star, you're going to always work with great people. You're yep. going to make it a change. And to be honest, you know, you do it enough to be your, your venture capitalist, you know, this, you do it enough, you're going to have enough wins in your, you're going to probably have more wins than losses or whatever you want to call it in Correct. your, uh, in your little black book. Yep. And to be honest, I think you're going to be probably a lot happier. A lot happier. I mean, the companies you're, you're with, they all change the world in some way. That's right. 
when you feel you're part of that, it's like, hey, this life was worth living. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I use one simple, you know, I, this sounds kind of corny, but I use the grandchild, uh, uh, the grandchild uh, uh, decision criteria. Are my, you know, are my grandkids going to look at me and go, wow, like you were part of, like you were part of Google, you were part of Amazon in the early days, you were like, you you were on the team that built the Pentium. Like, you know, I mean, I grew up in the Apollo era and, um, and it's probably no mistake that I, or no accident that I'm an aerospace engineer. I mean, you look at those things, those were moments in time where, you know, they're iconic. And for me, it's always been like, okay, if, if I'm going to go to a company or do this job, is it because it, you know, it's going to create a legacy and create history around it. And that's really what I've used. It's never been like, Oh, I'm going to get paid this much to do that job. It's never, it's like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Can that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for doing all that you do because yep. it made the world a better place. <laughs> and, and for us shoppers as well. <laughs> <laughs> Keep that in mind. <laughs> Speaking of like dividends and yields, I think we should uh, shift to the quick fire questions since we don't have a lot of time. And so, um, you know, what is an investment, financial or non-financial, you have made in the past year that yielded the biggest return? Uh, We're probably going to Wayfair, (laughs) 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 to be honest. Um, Well, over 10x during COVID-19, so... Yeah, you know, uh, in fact, I was talking to my uh, financial uh, uh, guys this morning and AMD, like AMD uh, was probably one of the biggest ones that I saw. Um, I couldn't, I, when I was at Google, I couldn't trade in NVIDIA because uh, sure. we were a customer of NVIDIA and, and uh, legally I probably could, but I felt it was probably unwise to do that. Um, right. But uh uh, Lisa Sue uh, and I know each other from MIT. And when she went to go be the CEO of AMD, I looked at it and said, one, you know, uh, back to, and they brought over Mark Papermaster. Uh, you just looked at the talent that they were amassing. Yeah. And, you know, I looked at AMD and said, okay, first of all, uh, you know, and I, I'm a former Intel person, I probably shouldn't say this, but I really felt like Intel had become a big company. And this was a much scrappier, nimbler company that candidly had nothing to lose. And I think they really got it in talking to some of the the folks around there. I think they really understood like how cloud computing would impact uh, microprocessors and they capitalized on their ability to move very, very fast. Uh, And I would argue that, you know, that's where understanding, you know, the industry and, and, uh, and that was, a, you know, in retrospect, it was a great investment. I my only regret is I probably should have put more into the company, but, <laughs> but that's how most of these, these things happen in life. So, um, and then, you know, I was an early advisor to DocuSign and, ah. uh, uh, Keith Kroc Keith. and I, uh, go way back and, Keith asked me very early on to come to the company and advise them. And I, you know, he gave me, I, I forgot a few thousand shares of, uh, of stock at a, at a very advantageous price. And I totally forgot about it. Like, uh, and no, that's you know, a bad I, thing. You, you don't know Sally, just keep it there. It, well, it's so funny because my investment guys had it and they, and I, this sounds horrible. I had been heads down on a bunch of projects. I totally missed the fact that they had IPO'd. <laughs> <laughs> and my investment guys were like, yeah, I think it was a, you know, like a standard $40. I forget what the IPO uh, price was. But uh, at the end of the day, they called me and they were like, hey, you know, you're sitting on these shares. And I'm like, wow, that's not trivial. And, uh, and, <laughs> and I said, look, the world's going to continue to go digital. Don't sell them. Just, just right. hold on to them. And, you know, now uh, I, I don't know what DocuSign was this morning, but they were trading, you know, over 200 at one point in time. And yeah, it's still, also it, a benefactor. It, yeah. Yeah. I'm so, a small share too, so I, yeah. I love it. Makes total and sense. Makes total sense, right? I mean, I just think they're missing a big opportunity to use ML and AI, but that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, well... I mean, I think they've digitized the workflow. I think they should yeah. also think about how do you digitize the content in a way that uh, 
that starts to extract value out of that great repository of, of all of the contracts that they hold. Right. So, but that again, topic for that's another a different day. conversation, but, but that's, yeah, that's that should right. be so much more fun. Yes. Yeah, exactly. But I just look at them and go, okay, they have so many green shoots to go and create $10 billion businesses that it's a fascinating place to be. Yeah. Speaking of semiconductors, um, you know this, and you appreciate this. Morris Chang will always be one of my, someone I look up to. Yeah. Um, from MIT, TI, yep. um, feel like he needs to go to somewhere he can build his own thing and yep. make TSMC work. And I hate to say it, but you know, market cap is not bigger than Intel. Who would have yep. thought that's been possible when he did that in yep. the Super Science Park in Taiwan? So just amazing seeing things, you know, year, decades ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've had the good fortune of working with Morris and not not intimately, but spending enough time with in meetings with him on some projects that we did that, you know, and it's super interesting because I remember being at MIT, maybe 92 or 93, and this Economist article came out, which was like the outsourced company or the virtual company was the name of the article, right? Yes. And it talked about, you know, how companies, how the enterprise was moving to a world where um you know, you wouldn't be completely vertically integrated. I was writing my, my thesis at DEC, the world's probably epitome of an integrated company, right? Right. And you can start to see the inklings of this. Obviously, the internet played a huge and continues to play a huge role in, in, that, uh, in that whole uh, structure. But, I mean, to me, it's amazing when you look in just a relatively short period of time that, you know, companies like, you know, Cisco, for example, they don't do any manufacturing. Most companies mm. don't do any manufacturing anymore. They do it with mm. the TSMCs or the Cables or the Foxcons of the world. And uh, it's just, uh, to me, it's amazing how quickly that shift occurred. Uh, and it, it, you know, again, that's a topic for another day, but it's had profound impact on the global economy. Yep. Okay. Quick fire question number two. Yep. What is something... <laughs> These aren't quick at all. Recently. I was about to say, yeah, these aren't very quick. <laughs> What's something you read recently you would recommend? You know, this is going to sound completely crazy because, um, uh, like, I have a ton of interest, and I, I, I helped. Uh, uh, I can tell. Yeah. Uh, I helped build um, the early days of some of the capability of Verily Google Life Sciences. So I'm still got a fascination with. Uh, with all things bio. And there's a great book um, that's called The Body. And it's written by, um, oh, it's too early in the morning. For, uh, anyway, it's called The Body. It's a bestseller right now. But it, it, it talks about, I'm a systems engineer and I like complex systems. And the body's probably, if not the, you know, a biological system is probably the most complicated thing on the planet. But I, I mean, uh, by uh, Bill, Bill, Bill Bar- yeah, Bill Bryson wrote it. And and Bill describes this in a way, you don't have to be a scientist, but it's super fascinating. And I, I mean, I've taken anatomy and physiology, I've taken you know, molecular biology, organic chemistry, yada, yada, yada. But this book is a fascinating read from, you know, who, who would have thought that <clears throat> reading about the body is one of those books you literally can't put down. Hmm. But it's one of the most fascinating books uh, that I've read. And I'm Sure, I should be talking about some great, you know, pithy computer science or ML or AI book, but uh, <laughs> but but I think oh, it's I probably inside of you. That's good. It's probably one of the most fascinating things that I've read in a while, and it's thought provoking. Thank you. And lastly, if you could spend a day in someone else's shoes, whose would they be, and why? Living or dead? Oh, Can be dead. Yeah. Oh, you know. I really, because I wanted to see, well, easy, Steve Jobs. Like, I interacted with Steve when I was at MIT just once, and it was a fascinating uh, interaction. I wouldn't tell you it was the most pleasant interaction in the world either. <laughs> you know, Steve told me I was an idiot for going, for going to MIT to grad school, which I begged to ask, you know, that was a shock to me, but explain to me, Steve, why you think that's the case. But, but he was a guy who, I mean, who saw the world in a completely different lens uh, and through a different, very, very, very different vantage point. And, you know, you know, Steve is, Steve is one of those iconic, one of a kind human beings who's obviously had a profound impact on the planet. Uh, and I really would, I, I really like to understand, like, how do you see the world? Like through what, through what perspective? Uh, Cause it's obviously not the one that, that I was schooled in or, or I grew up in, but I think that ability to look at the world very differently 
was the catalyst for a lot of what he did and what, what it, uh, Apple obviously has become today. But that's, you know, that's the person that I would love to see the world through. Great. You know, Perfect. son of a first generation immigrant from Syria, fell in love yep. with Indian Sanskrit. So can't, can't have more um, interesting figure than that. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it speaks here. You know, we talk about diversity a lot and, you know, look, I, I'm a huge, huge fan of diversity. And, you know, I saw it at Google, I saw it at Amazon, I've seen it throughout my career, I see it at Wayfair. The more diverse and dare I say even odd perspectives you bring to the table, yeah. the better we are, the better products we build. You know, we talked about, you know, how can you go build uh, a Chinese logistics system without having somebody who's lived it, eat it, you know, eat and breathe yeah. it, right? And I, I think that that's the lifeblood of one of those lifebloods of Silicon Valley. Um, you know, we, you know, you look at at a Google or the teams that I was involved in throughout my career in Silicon Valley. It was it was usually the United Nations. Yes, and it has to be. I think you know in this this social system and, and environment that we're living in right now. You know, I think it's it's and it's for all the right reasons. I think that we have to really, you know, carefully look at what's happening. But I think we also have to remember in that rich diversity is really the the way that we're going to solve the world's and the planet's biggest problems right now. And that's something I just, I think we just have to continually remind ourselves to think about. It makes the yeah. world it'll make the world a better place. Yeah, that's why I well believe that. You know, Black Lives Matter or. Uh, gender equality in the boardroom, all, all, yep. all these initiatives are extremely, extremely, extremely important for the welfare of uh, this country. Yeah, and I think the only thing is, you know, you've got a 10 month old. I mean, it sounds like you've got young kids. I've got a 20 year old who doesn't see the world the way that I see it. His friends are the UN, and yep. he doesn't care. Like, I don't think he, you know, he's just, he, to him, it's just that's how he grew up. So there's hope. There's hope. There's hope. And it's increasingly become a global issue. So there's yeah, hope. Absolutely. Yep. All right. We should wrap. Thank you so much. That was such a fascinating conversation. We, we both really enjoyed it. <laughs> oh my God. Hey, I want to talk you. to you all day. <laughs> <laughs> that was a pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity. Sure. Super cool. I mean, I knew for the panel, it will be a fun conversation. So this is even better than what we expected. So this is great. Yeah, we didn't get into astrophysics and astronomy. That's really yeah. my love. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, all right, so man. Thanks so much. Talk to you. Have a, good, have a great One day. Days. One of these days. One of these days. See ya. Okay. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.